Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you're having a fantastic day. In this video, I'm going to give you a deep dive into all the systems and abbreviations in Armored Core and what it all means. There's a lot of abbreviations and a ton of different stats. So let's break it down into bite-sized chunks so you know exactly what you're looking at and what to do when you're next looking to upgrade your Armored Core. As you can see right now, there are a lot of numbers and words. Please don't let this overwhelm you though, because when we start to break it down, most of it is pretty self-explanatory. And also, some of it doesn't really matter unless you're looking to really fine-tune your armored core and make it the absolute best it can possibly be for them last few endgame bosses and for PvP. So before we go into reviewing each of the individual parts, let's take a look at the core stats and what they all mean. Initially, you're probably thinking, oh, well, there's only these six. This is well easy. And a boom. <laughs> but don't worry, it is far easier than you think. So let's go through them and make sense of it all. Firstly, AP is equivalent to your health. Once this reaches zero, you are dead. Then you have three different types of damage in this game. Kinetic, energy, and explosive. Each weapon will do one of these damage types and you have individual resistances to each type. Next up, you have your attitude control system. This is basically your stagger meter. Just like in Sekiro, you can stagger. However, how you build your armored core will make you less and less likely to stagger. And we'll discuss how to change and manipulate this later. Next up, we have the recovery. Just like your stamina, which we'll talk about in a second, this is how fast your ACS will recover, therefore making it harder to stagger you. Next up, you have got target tracking. If you do want to use full auto lock on, a percentage of your shots will miss. As mentioned in my preview video, it is always better to try and get used to manual lock on. However, if you do want to rely on that auto lock on, this is the stat for you. Increase your firearm specialization spec and you will hit most of your shots anyway, even when your targets are whizzing around you. Next up is your boost speed and quick boost. You do specifically have a booster component that will increase your maximum boost speed, and this is literally just how fast you move around when boosting. However, this is also affected with a lower overall weight. You then have your quick boost stats, and this is basically your strafe or dodge. Again, various parts and weight will affect exactly how quick your quick boost is, how much energy it uses, and how quickly you can use consecutive quick boosts. Next up is your EN capacity, not to be confused with your EN output. EN, as mentioned, is your stamina. It is short for energy. And you have EN capacity for out in the battlefield. This is literally your stamina meter. You also have EN output, which is basically the total load that your armored core can carry. Again, just with your quick boost, you can manipulate exactly how quick your energy recharges and how quickly that recharge kicks in once you have run out of energy. Next up, we have our total weight, which as you can see is a combination of your weapons and your total load. And then finally, as mentioned, you have your total EN for your armored core itself and your current maximum. And the difference between these two numbers will improve your energy recovery speed out on the battlefield. Now, this may all be a little bit daunting initially, but let's break it down component by component and it will all become very clear very quickly. As we've talked quite a lot about energy already, let's start off with the generator, which is the primary component that will affect all of your various energy levels. This is the one I currently have equipped, and as you can see if I look at the two other generators that I own, this one is just outright worse in every aspect apart from the fact it weighs half as much. If we then take a look at the advanced stats, you can see that this will affect our boost speed, our quick boost speed, and also our quick boost recovery time. However, the trade-off for the significantly reduced energy capacity we get really isn't worth it. So now let's have a look at the other generator that I picked up very recently. In almost all aspects, this is a significant upgrade. It is far lighter with a massive energy output and capacity compared to our current one. However, the one really big drawback 
is if you don't manage your energy well and you completely run out, it is going to take nearly a full five seconds to recharge again. So this generator is fantastic when used in short bursts and if you are really good at your energy management. I, however, am not, so I'll probably stick with this one for now. But this is a great example of the trade-offs you can have and the significantly varying builds available to you in this game. As we're at generators, we may as well work from right to left. Let me just very quickly touch on expansions first, as they're right at the end here. Expansions are very unique compared to any other type of equipment, in that they do not affect anything but themselves. As you can see, it is literally changing none of my stats. Your expansion is kind of like your ultimate ability, and it's very much tailored to the situation you're in and your playstyle. Just to give you two very quick examples, I can use Pulse Protection here, which will shoot out a giant pulse barrier from my core, covering me from 4,000 damage points worth of damage for the next 25 seconds. Or I can equip the terminal armor, which is more of a Hail Mary. This is activated automatically when you reach 1 AP. This will protect you for 20,000 worth of damage, however, it only lasts for 2 seconds. In very niche situations, this is fantastic, but I much prefer the pulse protection. Now, let's take a look at the FCS. FCS is your fire control system. This is another inner armored core part that affects your target tracking and missile lock capabilities. Again, we can see here that the one I have equipped, though it weighs slightly more, is just significantly better in all aspects than the other one. However, again, when we open up the detailed menu, you can see that because it does weigh more, it is reducing my EN supply efficiency, it's reducing my quick boost speed, and even though it's very insignificant numbers, all of these things add up. The fire control system is absolutely fantastic if you're planning on using lots of auto-aim. Just make sure that the FCS that you have equipped aligns to the weapons that you are primarily using. I tend to stick with mid-range guns, so the 130 to 260 meter mark works perfectly for me. And please bear in mind, this is different to the target tracking that we mentioned at the start of the video. This is affected by your arms, and we'll cover that in just a minute. Now let's take a look at the booster. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm still getting my head around a few of these. This is definitely one of the more confusing components. If we bring it back to the basic menu, primarily what you're looking at is thrust, upward thrust, and quick boost thrust. How fast you can boost in a straight line, how fast you can boost upwards, and how fast you boost when quick boosting. That's pretty much as technical as you need to get. However, let's take a look at a few of the advanced stats just in case you really want to deep dive. One of the main stats that's neglected in the other view is your energy consumption. As you can see, my energy consumption for the upward thrust, the quick boost, and also the assault boost is significantly reduced when using a weaker booster. And we haven't touched on Assault Boost yet for this video. This one is very self-explanatory. If you press down L3, you will fly very, very fast for an extended period of time, but you will be quite vulnerable to attacks. So really, this shouldn't be used in combat. It's just to traverse terrain. Another stat that I definitely shouldn't neglect to mention is the fact that your booster also impacts your melee attacks. Armored cores are very, very fast. So even when trying to lunge in with your laser sword and home in on enemies, it's very easy for them to outpace you. However, with a faster booster, you are going to be able to close this gap much quicker and easier. And again, as with most components, this is obviously going to impact your consumption, your reload time and your weight. For me personally, big boost equals best boost, so I'll stick with the Alula. That is all of the internal parts covered, so now let's have a look at our legs. In my opinion, the legs have the biggest impact on your playstyle. There are four different types of legs, being tank, tetrapod, reverse joint, and bipedal. The biggest anomaly of the four is the tank, as this is the only one with built-in boosters. If you do equip tank legs, it will unequip your booster, and it will use its own internal one. That's why these are the only legs with their menu options. There is a far heftier tank available to you than the legs I have here. So let me just back out and show you quickly exactly how extreme you can go with your legs. 
Look at this bad boy. That almost doubles the AP of this part alone and takes my load limit to over 100,000. However, as you probably imagine, it makes you very, very slow. So use tank parts very cautiously and only when you really know what you're doing. For now, I think I will stick with my tetrapod legs because I love the fact that they enable you to hover. This is their unique mechanic. No other legs in the game can hover. It will use a very, very small amount of energy and it will keep you airborne for minutes at a time. Now, if we take a look at stat comparisons, the biggest difference you'll notice will be the jump distance and the jump height. Even though reverse joint legs are very weak, they make you extremely mobile, more than tripling the jump distance and jump height of tetrapod legs. They are also quicker with less recovery time. They are very agile, but very flimsy. Only use reverse joints when you really know what you're doing. Personally, I would just stick to bipedal legs. However, not really, really tanky ones like these because they're unnecessarily heavy for the bonuses that they give you. Also, as you can see here, when trying to use the crawlers specifically, we become overburdened despite the fact that they weigh less than my tetrapod legs. That is because legs are one of the parts that contribute to your load limit. This is the maximum weight that your legs can support, and high values mean that the legs can support more heavy parts. So even though they are about 15,000 weight lighter, my tetrapod legs can support 70,000 as opposed to the 50,000 of the crawlers. Again, another thing to keep in mind when choosing your legs. However, even though tetrapods are my favorite, I do think depending on your playstyle, any will work. They all have tremendous upsides depending on what it is you are looking for in your own armored core. Now we'll move on to the arms, which is a very quick one. The only new stats you have to look at here are your arms load limit, recoil control, firearm specialization, and melee specialization. The arms load limit is very self-explanatory. It's just the maximum weight your arms can carry without compromising your performance. Recoil control does exactly what it says on the tin. It's the accuracy reduction incurred by rapid fire weapons. Your firearm specialization is going to help with tracking performance when locking on and with multi-fire weapons such as missile launchers. And finally, melee specialization corresponds to an attack power percentage increase. So for instance, if my laser blade did 1000 damage, with these arms equipped, it would do 1020. Your arms do of course have an element of armor points and defenses, but they are minor compared to the likes of the core and the legs. So realistically, you're focusing specifically on offense. And as you can see, some of them have wildly varying stats. With these arms specifically being fantastic at tracking performance, but terrible with their recoil. So again, choose your arms wisely based on what weapons you're planning on using. Next up, we have the second most important component after your legs, your core. If we take a look at what the core has to offer, again, this is going to be a big increase to your armor points and your defenses. But perhaps more importantly, after your legs, the core is the thing that's going to affect your attitude stability mostly. And remember, that is how easy it is for you to become staggered. So the higher that is, the less easily you'll become staggered. Apart from that, the other things we want to look at are your adjustment values. And this is basically a percentage increase or decrease to your booster efficiency, your generator output, and your generator supply. So as you can see, if I switch from my currently equipped core to the VP40S, though I take a big hit in my AP and defenses, some of my other stats get an insane boost. My boost speed and quick boost stats are buffed significantly, along with my energy recharge delay and my weight. I personally do value a higher defense, but I'm not going to lie, that quick boost energy consumption is really making me want to switch out my core. So for me, maybe it's just a fashion thing. I don't really like how chonky that is. Maybe I want to be a bit more quick and nimble. So let's switch out of the VP40S for the rest of this video. And finally, for the external parts, before we take a look at the weapons, you have your head. And the three primary stats that your head affects that we haven't touched on 
is going to be your system recovery and this is how resistant you are to anomalies usually known as status effects in other games such as electricity buildup which could instantly stagger your ac and also your scan distance and duration this is very important not only for detecting enemies but also detecting new parts that you can collect on missions and for that reason despite the fact it has taken a big hit in ap and defenses as you can see i've chosen the head with the longest scan distance though the melanda c3 is looking pretty good to me actually it only has a slightly reduced scan distance it lasts nearly twice as long and the defenses are really good so you know what let's switch out to the melanda and finally we're now onto the juicy bits let's have a look at the weapons the weapons are definitely the parts I can give you the least guidance on because this really is going to come down to your own playstyle. There are so many different types of weapons and so many things to consider that it's practically impossible for me to tell you one thing is better than the other. All I can do is explain to you what it all means and let you go and have a look yourself. The one great piece of advice I will give you is use play video. That will give you a little preview on what the weapon does. Even after reading all of these stats, sometimes it's much easier to just see it in action, and this is a great and quick way of doing so. The specs that are the most self-explanatory obviously is going to be attack power and impact. Attack power being the damage it deals, and impact being the ACS damage that it deals, ACS being the stagger meter. Next up you have direct hit adjustment which is how much extra damage it deals when an enemy is staggered. But this weapon deals nearly double damage when fired against a staggered enemy. You also have the amount of recoil that occurs when firing as we touched on earlier. And this can be a little bit confusing, it looks as though it's really bad because the bar's full. In fact a full bar always means good no matter what the stat is referring to. If we take a look at like a bazooka or a rocket launcher or even the shotguns you can see that the recoil bar is very very low because there is a lot of recoil on shotguns. Also shout out to the fact that this bazooka is called Majestic! If this isn't a Bloodborne reference then I don't know what is. I really hope to see more references like this in the game. If I see enough, I'll probably make a video showing them all off to you because I love that so much. Anyway, back to the gun I was using as an example. Then you also have the ideal and the effective range. Basically, if you are outside of these two ranges, your attacks are likely to ricochet, dealing a tiny, tiny percent of the damage that they should be dealing. And you can see from these numbers exactly why I like to play with a medium build for my fire control system. Next up is how many bullets are fired within one second, the size of the magazine, how many total rounds you're bringing with you, reload time and the ammo cost. The ammo cost is far more important than you'd think. You literally are penalized at the end of every mission for how much ammo you have used, i.e. how much money you have spent on the ammo that you have used. In fact, here's a brief side-by-side -side of me doing well in a mission and me doing not so well in a mission and exactly how much additional money I gained. It is very crucial and definitely one of the tips that will be going in my beginner's guide video, so make sure you go check that out. Now that we've gone through this, you're probably thinking, Dom, this is nowhere near as confusing as you said it was. This is just a standard bullet firing gun. As you can see, some guns have cooling because they don't have a magazine they need to cool off and will overheat if you use them too much. And another type of gun I haven't showed off because I'm not, should we say, skilled enough to use them yet, is laser guns. So laser guns, as you can see, look at all of these stats here. They have charged attacks as well. Along with that, you will have the charge time, the charge EN load, the charge ammo consumption, cooling, the list goes on. Charge attacks themselves are very simple. They're very easy to pull off. The only problem is when you're in the heat of combat, keeping an eye on how long it takes for your gun to charge can become very taxing when also trying to dodge out the way of enemy attacks. So as you see here, the charge time for this rifle is 1.6 seconds. However, if you spend 1.5 seconds charging the gun, 
it will still do the normal base amount of attack power of 256 as opposed to the charge value of 1222. So if you accidentally release that trigger 0.1 second too early, you have just wasted 1.5 seconds of combat time. And likewise, once it's fully charged, it won't automatically fire. You need to release the trigger. So if you're charging it for too long and forgetting to release that button every 1.6 seconds, you are making yourself far less effective than you can be. Charged weapons, I'd say, are probably the most powerful guns in the game, but they also have the highest skill cap and they are very tough to use. So now that we've covered the arm weapons, I have one more category to show you before we move on to the back weapons and that is melee weapons. Again, these have completely different stats than guns. Again, they have the attack power and the impact, but it also tells you how many hits you can chain, and also the PA interference, because melee weapons are fantastically good at breaking enemies' shields. Here you can see I have opted to stick with the pulse blade, even though I do have the pile bunker, which is just outright so much better in most categories. The reason I've stuck with the Pulse Blade is because this only has one attack, whereas the Pulse Blade has two. And you may be saying to me, yeah, but it's charged attack. It does three times as much damage. However, it's very easy to miss the first attack because of how quick armored cores move, but it's not so easy to move the second as long as your homing speeds are very fast. So you are likely to miss the first attack of the Pile Bunker and the Pulse Blade, but then you will probably catch the enemy with the second hit. And not only that, even though the Pile Bunker has significantly more powerful attack power, the impact isn't actually as much as you'd think. Two hits from the Pulse Blade is still going to deal more impact than one hit from the Pile Bunker, and melee weapons primarily should be used for building up the stagger on your enemies, so that you can then rain hell with your missile launchers. And talking of that, let's move on to back weapons. Back weapons are far more extensive than just missile launchers, but they really are my favorite, so they've all I've bought. So let's look at the shop and see what else is on offer. As you can see, we have a grenade cannon, a laser cannon, an active homing missile launcher, a plasma launcher. In fact, we have two plasma launchers, one with twice as many rounds as the other. And on your left back unit, you can also get a variety of shields. So there is a tremendous amount of weapons you can use on your back as well. Now, if we take a look at the stats, again, we all know how rocket launchers work. They're pretty self-explanatory. The one main difference is that most of them come with the ability to multi-lock, as you see here. If you hold down to charge, just like you would with a charged weapon, it will automatically detect a number of targets within range and spread the shots out between all of them. Now, different missile launchers do have different max lock counts and homing lock times. For instance, the one I've opted for here is very dramatic. It takes nearly a full second to lock on, but it can lock on to up to 10 different targets and dealing well over a thousand damage if every rocket hits. And without the firearm specialization from your arms, they are more likely to miss. So make sure if you're relying on rockets that you are using arms with a high firearm specialization. But anyway, back to the rockets. The ones I would advise you really keep an eye out for are vertical launchers because vertical launchers have an insanely good guidance system. By their very nature, they bypass most enemies' cover and defenses, and their high trajectory means it is very easy for them to hit their target. So sacrificing a bit of attack power to mean they are hitting far more often is a very, very valuable change. And on top of that, you then have plasma missile launchers. Plasma missile launchers don't really do anything quite as well. However, they are AOE. So they rarely miss their targets and they are very good at mopping up groups of smaller enemies. So having one plasma missile launcher and one vertical missile launcher means you are pretty much always guaranteed to hit your targets and deal tremendous amounts of damage to them. Now, as I mentioned, on your left back unit specifically, you can switch out to have a shield. There are various different shields that will help you in different ways. 
similarly to Souls games, they do have a perfect block window. This is referred to as an initial guard, and certain shields have a much better initial guard than others, usually the pulse bucklers. So if I go to the shop and show you a pulse buckler, you will see that the stats for the initial guard are far better. However, the duration window is much smaller, so you need to be really perfect on your perfect block. But if you do, it will negate almost the entirety of the attack because bearing in mind, these are percentage numbers. So if you're really comfortable with blocking and you know enemies' attacks, I would definitely advise using the initial guard window of bucklers. However, if not, I would stick to a really solid pulse shield that has great damage mitigation and impact dampening just for holding your shield out in front of you. That's about all there is to say on shields. The last thing I wanted to say is you've probably noticed that I have two back slots on my back units. This is due to an OS chip that I purchased and it is called the weapon bay. This will allow you to replace your shoulder weapons for two more right hand and left hand weapons. This is really good in very, very niche situations if you just want like four machine guns, for instance. I see very, very limited situations where that may be helpful. I would advise not bothering to get that upgrade and just stick with your rocket launchers, your grenade launchers and your shields. They are far better it is far better to have a variety rather than just trying to spam loads of different guns. Also, in getting that upgrade, you can't use all four at the same time because your back buttons, instead of using the guns, they actually switch them out to your main weapons. So you've effectively just got two guns with two backup guns rather than being able to use four all at once. Long story short, Weapon Bay sounds really cool on the surface, but it's not, don't use it. Now, hopefully all of the stats and all of the parts in Armored Core make at least a bit more sense to you than they did previously. Make sure you check out my beginner tips video as well once it's out, because that will help you even further when you actually get onto the field of battle. For now, my friends, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.